and welcome to this happy guru. Namaste. Um, I've been away for a month traveling around France and Spain, so back now um, and really ready to share some of the things that I kind of learned along the way, um, as well as some of the stuff that's been really capturing my attention, um, stuff that the universe has been kind of throwing at me over the last month as well. Um, one of the things that I kind of discovered on our little trip, like just as a quick briefing, I'm a we have a family of five, um, my three children, myself, my husband, and big fur baby. So I suppose that makes six. Um, we've got Rhodesian Ridgeback who's coming with us as well. We've been traveling around for the last month in our camper van. Um, it's the first time we've done this. It's, it's a relatively new camper van to us, but it's actually quite an old camper van in terms of age. Um, and we kind of, you know, we, we bought it because we wanted the freedom in life. We bought it because coming back from our life in Thailand felt very much like kind of returning to the norm. And we wanted to kind of keep instilling adventure into our lives, into the lives of our children and, you know, just kind of keep everybody on the edge and, and still moving. Um, but this was the first kind of big holiday that we've done with it. Um, and we've just taken it away for kind of weekends um, and long, like long weekends, five day trips and stuff beforehand. So this was our first chance at really kind of living on the road and living in the camper and on the go. Um, and one of the things that kind of became really obvious straight away was how small a confined <laughs> the camper is for five people, for three children, a dog and two adults. It was a small space. And I kind of, I think I thought in my mind that it was going to be quite a simple transition that we were kind of all just going to get in and everybody was going to have the same sort of enthusiasm level that I did about it and it soon became quite obvious that emotions were running high um, and this was the first time I suppose in the month that I really began to kind of recognize how emotional we are as a family um, ordinarily we live in a fairly big house it's a four-bedroom house um, and there's a lots of nooks and crannies to kind of get yourself lost in and what I realized is actually we all tend to uh, knowingly lose ourselves in the house as much as we can. So what I mean by that is that, you know, bedrooms are utilized in this house. We don't all kind of sit in one place and just go to different places to, to sleep. We all tend to go off to our own little places, get done what we need to get done, whether it be my daughter playing with her hamster or my son up on his, um, you know, on his computer doing his because he does some blogging and stuff like that, whether it was that or my husband going into his, his man cave um, and me going into my woman cave um, to get our work done and to, you know, have a little bit of time to kind of be doing research or, or reading or, or whatever it is that we want to be doing. And so initially for that kind of family of five who are used to quite a lot of space in our lives, it was, it was quite a challenge. And as I said, emotions ran high. We, I noticed, first of all, that we were all quite quick to temper where we couldn't kind of get away from one another, we felt very reacted by one another. Um, and we were, um, whether that reaction was kind of negative or positive, it was very quick. Um, it was, if, if someone kind of, you know, did something funny, we were all involved. Um, we were all kind of vested in that humor, in, in laughing at, the, at what had happened and, you know, and, and really being in that moment, which was lovely. Um, on the kind of the counterbalance of that as well, if there was somebody who felt, you know, one of us felt a little bit like slighted or something had been said that we didn't agree with or we weren't happy with, then we were very vocal and it, and it kind of, you know, arguments and stuff ensued quite quickly um, because I think we weren't able to kind of get our own space and evaluate the situation. And so managing that with my three children was one thing managing that with myself was another um i found that i was kind of really leaning into what it was that was triggering me um things like uh i think things like leaving stuff around became a big deal for me it's actually quite a big deal for me in my house as well i don't like it that you know the kids leave clothes on the floor and all that sort of thing that triggers me i try and remain patient i'm kind of always working on that um, but it does, you know, I, it's, I think it, it triggers that whole fear aspect of me that I'm just taken for granted um, and that I just forever will be, I think, really is, is that, that kind of thing. And I'm sure the majority of mums go through this um, feeling of, like, you know, like, I, am I just the slave in this house? Am I the only one who's, you know, picking up, cleaning up, tidying up? What's going on? Why have I inherited this role the minute I found myself? you know, with child type thing. <laughs> um, and I think that's quite a common thing for, for, for women, for mothers to go through. Um, and even probably a lot, of, a lot of dads as well, you know, feeling taken for granted for one thing or another. 
but it was that feeling that um, of being taken for granted, or that fear, if you like, that I found was the easiest trigger to kind of get me going, to kind of get me a little bit volatile um, and for me to lose my patience. And knowing that I was kind of moving more into that emotional side of myself by being in this strange situation with my family, I really began to watch what it was that was triggering me, the things that were coming up that were triggering uh, my girls, um, my son, and my husband, um, and how we all reacted to that um, emotionally, you know, how, whether or not we took sides, whether we distanced ourselves, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with humans, um, and their emotions that are very subtle, this is something that came kind of across to me, it might be, you know, quite an obvious thing to say, if you think about, you know, when you, when somebody's sad, and you might just kind of reach your hand over just to touch them, or, or touch them in the arm, or, or, you know, something as obvious as putting your hand around a shoulder feels quite an obvious gesture, um, an emotional support uh, in gesture, um, and, and that one, I think, that felt quite obvious, but there are a lot of little kind of emotional gestures that came with the realization that we were all experiencing this together. And this wasn't coming just from the adults in the group. This was coming from the children as well. Quite a natural feeling to try to reach out and touch people and reach out and connect when you can see that they are struggling in one way or another. Um, same thing I found when emotions were positively running high. You know, when we were excited to go down to the beach, when we were arriving in a new place, when we're getting out, we're going for a restaurant, something like that. And again, it, it became this kind of grouping together of us all. We wanted to all be in that in that state together. We were graviating towards one another so that we were kind of present in that energy, in that high vibe, if you like, of you know being excited to be in somewhere getting all the clothes on, getting all the suntan lotion on, you know, getting the goggles together, the flippers, the boards, all that sort of thing to go down the beach. We all were moving very closely around one another um, and enjoying that space that we were holding for one another as well. Um, and so, yeah, I really began to kind of look at the emotions that we were expressing individually um, as a family and what were the triggers for the kind of the, the good emotions that were being expressed, as well as the harder emotions that were being expressed. And it got me really thinking about emotions. Um, and it got me really thinking about how they play such a physical part in our lives as well. Because I think for the majority of us, we tend to think about emotions being something that we kind of just express. They're feelings, yes, um, but they're really kind of expressions of how we respond to certain stimuli um, and I think what kind of began to come out to me about the way that we hold them physically was about the way that I was feeling things within my physical self so there's one thing to be in expressing an emotion and it, it's very easy to express an, emo and express an emotion through your vocabulary through speech um, through attenuation, you know all those sorts of again subtle things about your speech that will allow other people to pick up on how you might be feeling what emotions you are actually expressing um, but also where I actually physically felt it I noticed that when I was trying to kind of defend myself and you know justify what I was saying to either my husband or to the children a lot of the time I, I kind of felt like things were getting stuck in my throat and I would <clears throat> often be <clears throat> and clearing my throat uh, gulping down, you know, trying just trying to kind of alleviate the airways a little bit so that I might be able to speak a little bit more easily um, and feel more confident. That was kind of the, the subtle feeling that was coming alongside that was the, the lack of confidence that I felt speaking my truth, if you like, saying, you know, hang on a minute. Like, for example, one stage um, I was, you know, basically asking for some for me time. Uh, I wanted to kind of go off. I needed to do some stuff. I wanted to do some reading. I'd kind of put all these textbooks and stuff away with me um, to continue on my my ever, <laughs> ever increasing study bracket that I, I keep dipping into. Um, and I just felt like, you know, I was being drawn on for everything. Oh, mum, can you come with me to do this? Can you come with me to do that? Or would you mind to do this? Kirst? Would you mind to do that? You know, and I just felt like, actually, you guys are asking me to do stuff so that you can just sit there um, and not do anything. And we're all on holiday here. And I felt like kind of that was something that I perhaps needed to reflect back. <laughs> um, and but asking for that was getting caught in my throat. You know, that emotion, that that feeling of actually injustice, I suppose, initially that injustice that hang on a minute I'm really being put on here um, and then to kind of actually having to stand up for myself 
was a feeling that definitely kind of came from sort of my stomach and my heart area um, and then was coming up to my throat. And it was I was feeling quite challenged by that. And I noticed that a couple of times it would actually the words would stick in my throat and I find myself clearing my throat and and uh, and waiting and, and sort of gulping down whatever it was that was holding my throat tightly as I was trying to speak. So that was kind of one of the things that really kind of raised my attention and got me thinking about emotions and, and the physicality of emotions. Um, and then also towards the end of our trip, um, a very dear friend of mine passed away. And that stirred up in me loads of different emotions, like so many different emotions and emotions that came from the past as well, because this is a friendship that I've had for 30 years. This is somebody that I've known um, throughout my secondary education, um, throughout my adult life. Um, and uh, she was a, a very a dear friend who, you know, helped me a lot, um, especially in my 20s, you know, helped me a lot. Um, and was always kind of there for me, was always somebody who, when, you know, when you needed somebody to listen, um, she was, she was always there. And so there was a lot of, obviously, attachment um, to that friendship. But there was also stirrings of guilt. Um, you know, the, the same sort of questions, I suppose, a lot of us ask ourselves when, when a friend passes or, or somebody moves away from us. So we, we experience loss is, you know, could I have done more? Could I have helped more? Was there anything that I could have said better or, you know, was there more times that I could have been there for her? Um, could I have said things, you know, better? Could I have done things better? All those sorts of things, you know, that, that kind of just come through your mind um, and seemingly through your body as well, because I was really feeling um, pain in kind of my, my back. Um, there was obviously a lot of pain around my heart. I felt like there was a hole developing in my heart from the moment I was I was told that she passed on. Um, and it's actually, that hole seems to have just gotten bigger, really, um, as time's passed. And I think the reality of the situation is beginning to sink in. It's almost like I'm experiencing that loss more as the days go on. And, you know, I start doing silly things like looking for, we use text on WhatsApp. Um, and we started doing that when I was living in Thailand because it was free, you know, everything else kind of, you know, if you text, you have to pay. So it was like, wow, it's a free way of keeping in contact. Hey, this is going to be great. Um, and so we started doing that. So I would be forever just looking for the double ticks, you know, the, the double ticks that had been delivered and then the blue double ticks that it, the message had been read. Um, and I, the, I, we, you know, I find myself doing that still. Um, and the, the whole gets deeper if you like, as the realization that she's just not there anymore sinks in. Um, and so that was something as well that I really had to deal with um, and looking at kind of, I suppose, the layers of feeling and emotion that are attached to that one relationship. And it wasn't a relationship that was without its kind of, you know, disagreements. We had a very honest relationship, um, uh, you know, especially towards the end. I think we were quite candid about, you know, some of the times that, you know, we've been hurt by one another. Uh, and over the years, and this is, again, something that, you know, I suppose emotion you're carrying with you, um, not just in your mind, but somewhere in your physicality as well. Um, and so we, you know, we had done a lot of kind of clearing the air, if you like, and that had, I believe, made us sort of stronger as friends. We were much more candid, much more honest with one another moving forward from that. Um, but still, there were still questions that I was asking myself. Still, there were these uncomfortable feelings coming up in my body. And it really, again, with that and the fact that kind of, you know, I'd been doing a, a little bit of this kind of emotional mindfulness around our family and, and within our trip really began to highlight to me the importance of emotions um, as part of the experience that we have as human beings, but also how physical that response is as well emotions are not just something that kind of come from the heart emotions are something that are felt within us um within the energy bodies i believe um uh, you know of our body so talking initially about like the chakra points so for my yoga i was kind of going through uh, i'm looking at the chakra points of our body and looking what those were associated with and where i might find the root to the emotional feeling that i was feeling physically um, at that time. So I went into my kind of my little seven major chakras 
a uh, little printout thing here. This is what I give to my kids for their kids yoga. And it's just, a, I just happen to have one with me. So it's a nice, easy point of reference. Um, so just to kind of, you know, go through, if you're not aware of, of the chakras, they are the energy points within our body running up from the root chakra, which is uh, situated um, right at the very base of the spine that encompasses the um, kind of the, the organs down below, if you like, um, moving up then to the sacral chakra, just kind of at the back below your um sort of i'm sorry at the back like just below your belly button around that sort of area in a kind of a band i, I always imagine the chakra points the energy points to be within ourselves so it's i don't want to say front and back so much because that confuses for me what is quite a and quite a a real feeling of um these energy points that coincide rush for me at certain times um, when you can feel the energy kind of really rooting you to the ground, you can feel in meditation, in certain meditations where I'm working with the chakras, where I'm sending my energy out from those points, and that that energy uh, moves through my body as heat in some instances, and moves out right to the very very tips of my fingers, right to the very top of my head, down towards my feet. It's a very real feeling. Um, so to, to kind of pinpoint them, um, it, it feels a bit a little bit strange but so anyway moving on to the sap that you've got then the solar plexus which is around the belly button area around what we might call kind of your diaphragm area um for those of you who maybe suffer from anxiety it would be that chakra that would react very strongly when you're feeling anxious when you're feeling nervous uh, if you're worried about anything um you know we, we have that saying that the butterflies in my stomach you know i'm nervous about the butterflies in my stomach because you have that sensation of movement within and around your sacral chakra um and as i go through later you know all of these things are really really relevant so the next one up from that will be your heart chakra you know centered around your heart from your heart you come up to your throat chakra centered around your throat from there we come up to the uh, agnus chakra the third eye chakra here um then you have your uh sahasahara chakra the top and then like which can be like your crown chakra often known as that as well um if you get out of the very basics of chakras there are many many more that, that permeate out through your aura um, and connecting you deeply um up with well, up deeply but connecting you with the world as a whole connecting you down into the world of the grounding um those sorts of things um so i'm going to go into them in another show because i think the chakras are actually a show in themselves you know they're they're fascinating and there's so many layers to that kind of study that i think they deserve that but what was really in, like i suppose one of the things that touched me the most initially when i started looking at these chakra points and where i was feeling my emotions was how accurate the information that i've been passed down through around these these seven major chakras was about the feelings that i was having so for example your throat chakra when I was kind of speaking my truth and asking for help um, and asking that I be heard, and this was the kind of the area that was reacting for me. This is kind of when I'm like clearing my throat and feeling like there's something stuck down there and, you know, all those sorts of things. That, you know, even my voice was being affected by it, like, <clears throat> you know, and it was bothering me. You know, it, it annoyed me that I wasn't able to speak clearly when I most wanted to be heard. Um, and yet the throat chakra is very much about communication uh, creativity and re re um, resonance so again being heard you know being like when you you're speaking you are speaking you are creating as you speak every word that you vocalize is building a construct whether it be in your mind or for the person listening to you um, you know or out to the big wide world um, as I often do a lot of the retreats, you know, being able to speak out to the universe, being having your voice heard, having the things that are, that are manifesting in your mind and in your heart actually vocalized is a construct. Um, you know, it's a way of constructing the world around us, a way of believing what it is that we're saying or the way of um, encouraging a belief system, shall we say, for the world around us. So I got interested in what kind of else was going to be happening around that area because like i say for me the chakras are this kind of moving energy ball if you like um, or presence um within these points and i got to thinking about how 
if the chakras are blocked, uh, if that energy is blocked, if everything doesn't flow there, how does that then affect us physically? Because listen, if just the emotion that affects that area can affect me physically, then what about all the, the belief systems that emotions you know affect? What about all that sort of stuff? So I got into it. You know how I like to get into, uh, I really like to get into all this sort of stuff and start studying and, and drawing from my books and, and really looking through the internet as to what I can find. And I found some really fascinating stuff that's opened up a whole kind of can of worms with me about disease, about mental health, um, about how we treat one and like ourselves specifically, um, but also about how we treat one another, emotional triggers that um, can directly affect our physical health. Um, and so I started coming up with all these sorts of things. So just staying with the uh, throat chakra for the moment, as I've used that an example, I looked at um, some information from uh, Louise Hay um, and the Hay House Productions about um, emotional energy centers of the body. So uh, the throat center is particularly uh, suggested here to be a point of self-expression. Uh, also lack of trust if there's any kind of issue around your throat. So this was like disease within the body. This was um, how the energy centers of your body, i.e. the chakras, can, if they're out of balance, if they're not... Um, if they're not channeling correctly, um, this is what they can kind of affect within your life, within yourself, right? So it's a lack of trust, inability to speak your feelings. And then physically, that can be affecting your thyroid, which, of course, your thyroid gland is, is located in this central part here in the throat. So that could um, affect your thyroid, either hyperthyroid or hypothyroidism, um, you know, the, the speeding up or the slowing down, depending on how you are manifesting your truth, your emotions um, around that area, around your, th your throat area. If you're somebody, for example, who doesn't feel confident enough to speak and, and say their truth, if you feel like you are being held back by a relationship in your life and, and you're not able to express yourself fully, um, if, you know, obviously things like smoking, things uh, like hot drinks, spicy foods, uh, really cold drinks, in fact, all affect the throat area. Um, my husband had to have a couple of nodules release, uh, removed from the back of his throat. And we found out all this crazy stuff about what he should and shouldn't be eating, what he should and shouldn't be drinking, temperatures and stuff, and things, um, certain spices that would really aggravate his throat um, following surgery. So this was kind of um, medical advice from, from the, the doctor in Thailand about exactly how he should be looking after himself going forward. But it wasn't about anything particularly emotional. It was just about, you know, what things affect the throat area. Um, obviously, if you're a singer, somebody who speaks for a living, my husband's a salesman. So, you know, he is always on the phone talking to clients, talking to customers, you know, always managing stuff. It's, it's an integral part of his business that he's able to speak. And so there's a lot of pressure on there and also a lot of stress on there as well because um you know as somebody who is constantly negotiating as somebody who is constantly kind of justifying and problem solving and managing and you know all these the relationships the dynamics um the physical part of his business he, he you know he, he works with with cloth so he's kind of liaising between mills and, and clients who buy and, and this sort of stuff so he's constantly 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 talking things through um and managing um and there are times you know I've, I've heard him on the phone there are times when it's a very stressful conversation that he's having and the doctors that spoke to him about having his nodules removed were very much of the idea that he should have some sort of vocal therapy for afterwards because the reason he got these nodules because the stress that he was under at work was encouraging to speak more from his throat than from his lung so whether you're aware or not as you when you begin to speak you tend to involuntarily take a deep breath in and it's kind of that i suppose that uh, that breathing step forward take a deep breath and move forward and again we're aware of all these sorts of things if we really think about it but perhaps not subconsciously and perhaps not when we're kind of dipped out of that mode um so 
when he would speak in a kind of a stressed environment, perhaps he was having a, you know, a heated conversation with somebody, you know, querying something, so many things that happen in his day um, that require him to be quite kind of determined, if you like, and, and a little bit perhaps forceful with where he's going so that, you know, people don't just bow out of orders half the half way through when the mill's busy making it and all these sorts of things. Anyway, he, uh, you know, would really, when the stressful times came, he would stop that breathing in and he would just talk from his larynx, from his voice box, talking out and really forcing some of the words out to be able to get them across and to be able to get his voice heard, if you like. Um, and so consistently doing that over a long period of time, he's been doing this job a long time, consistently doing that and consistently putting the pressure onto this area had caused these nodules and nodules are kind of like um corns if you like or rough blisters where if you do hard work you know maybe if you're digging the garden you find that you know the, the skin all along uh, underneath your fingers will become quite calloused um, and basically that's what these things are and um, that they're present in your throat where there's constant reverberation constant work on that area and it causes this kind of you know skin this tissue malfunction if you like where they it gets quite solid and quite hard and can be quite uncomfortable um so that's what happened with him and this is how he kind of began learning about that learning about um you know the throat and how delicate it is actually and and how the ways that you communicate um the things that you say um how you feel you're being heard it, you know this all comes into um this is my dog sorry Zion. it all comes I don't, it all comes into 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 um, into your physical presence so the emotion that you're expressing that stress all comes into your physical presence it it becomes um, you know really something that you experience on a physical level not just an emotional level it's not just straight to flight and fight response um, you know it's not just straight into a reflex response it's actually present in your physicality and that was a big eye opener for us then. You know, obviously they had to do tests as to whether or see they were cancerous. And it was a, it, you know, kind of a big thing for us at that time. But it taught us a lot. And it, taught, it really opened my eyes to how we can hold on to emotions and stress within our physicality. And as we're really beginning to realize, um, stress is a huge disease causer. You know, huge. I remember when I did my reflexology and my anatomy and physiology um, exams, God, like 13 years ago now, 12 years ago, sorry, 12 years ago now. Um, and I found out all about the anatomy and physiology and again, really opened my eyes um, as to how amazing our bodies are, but also to how reactive we are to things. And then, back then, 12 years ago, we were told in, in our class that, you know, 75% of all disease is caused by stress. That was then. If I'm honest with you now, I'd probably bring that higher up to kind of 85, 90 percent of all disease, because with the advent of all the amazing vaccinations and stuff like that, that we have, whether you agree with them or not, they have eradicated a lot of disease across the world. When you think about the um, increase and the improvement in our um, Sorry. I don't know why he wants to come in for love. He just wants to come in and sit on me, basically. He's a big fur baby. And you can see that I'm uh, getting emotional. Go and sit down. Um, and he's reacting to that. So he would right, sit, sit, sit. Good boy. I dare. I dare. I dare. Good boy. Um, yeah, so I was really in, intrigued learning about that and learning about how stress, which to me at the time was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, stress. I, I kind of, I get stressed. You know, I get stressed on the road if someone's kind of driving like an idiot or I think they're driving like an idiot. I'll get stressed at work when there's a big workload um, and, you know, I don't feel like I'm going to get through it by five o'clock and I need to get out because I've got other plans after work or whatever. You know, I, I, I appreciate what stress is. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think I had any idea of what prolonged stress is and can be and how detrimental that can be to your health. And I certainly had very little idea as to how prevalent that is in Western society, how many of us are living with prolonged stress in our lives. Um, and, you know, some stress is good. Some stress is good for you. You know, it gives you that kind of kick up the bum that you might need to get going with things. Um, it keeps you kind of focused. 
uh, it's certainly a way of being able to kind of channel energies into getting stuff done. Um, however, prolonged stress is something very different. You know, stress that comes in and can be dissipated is one thing, but prolonged stress, living with stress constantly, you know, is very detrimental to our health um, on so many levels, to your mental health, to your emotional health, to your physical health. And as I've discussed before, um, you know, everything within us, these, these the, so many parts to us, but they're all so closely integrated. Um, and, and, you know, we all function within these different parts of ourselves the whole time. You know, my emotional self, my intellectual self, or my, my psychic self, if you like, and my physical self are all present doing everything that I'm doing. And so when one's affected, they affect all the other parts. And as I think we're becoming a little bit more aware of now, the negative side of that means that, you know, you're, you're under a lot of physical duress as well. And so this is kind of really what's begun to kind of surface in, in my research and in, and in my thought processes is, you know, actually we've got so many people living in a, in a, like a real concurrent level of stress throughout their entire day. They're getting up, they're feeling stressed. They're going to work, they're feeling stressed. They're coming home, they're feeling stressed. There's no let up from it. And it's because of a number of different things. I don't want to pinpoint one thing. Um, but there are a number of different things, the lifestyles that we're all living now that are really huge stress factors. Um, and again, that's kind of something that perhaps I'll take and, and put into another show is that how actually you can try to manage the stress that you are living and where that starts from in your life. You know, how you can start that journey of really looking at your life and looking at where the stressful parts of it are and what that actually physically is beginning to kind of mean to you, um, how quickly you jump into your emotions um, and how quickly you react to things rather than giving your chance the yourself the opportunity to respond. So while we're talking about the throat, some of the other kind of stuff that was coming up was about um, not your inability to speak your feelings to be able to actually be honest about how it is that you're feeling. And of course, that's about being honest about emotions. And I recognize that we often have very, very negative connotations towards expressing emotion. You know, we see anger as being a very negative emotion. And yeah, if you want to put negative and positives onto things, anger is a more negative emotion than say, you know, joy. Absolutely. But it's also a very necessary emotion. It's also an emotion that is 100% natural. There isn't a person in this world who can't be brought to anger. Uh, you know, even, I would say, even monks and, you know, even the Dalai Lama, there would have been something that was said where he feels anger because of the injustice, because of fear, because, I mean, you know, let's let get into all the emotions that they are. But, you know, it's a natural thing to feel. And yet somehow, somewhere along the line, we've all gotten kind of guilt and anger almost interlinked. You know, if you feel angry and, and you respond angrily, then the guilt comes so quickly afterwards. If you express anger, then there may be some level of sorrow as to the length that you've taken that expression and to perhaps what, you know, how you express that anger, the way that you express that anger, perhaps you were particularly nasty in something that you said, and straight away you feel sorrowful that you've actually said that, you know, these are the kind of the range of emotions um, that interlink and, 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 and move from one to the other kind of so seamlessly within ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, when you, you know, one of the things that I felt like actually that really resonates with me is being able to speak your truth, being able to speak how, you know, speak through your emotions and express what it is that you're feeling so that you're being honest and you're being open and people are understanding really where you're coming from and what exactly has kind of triggered that. Not simply so that they can learn a little bit more about you, although obviously going forward that would be nice, you know, not having the same triggers thrown at you all the time so that you're constantly getting, you know, angry or irate or, or, or upset with somebody. Um, you know, certainly it's nice when people take the time to learn about you so that they're not pressing all those buttons. Um, but also, you know, how natural emotions are and how they need to be expressed. They are something that 
very much brings your attention into the moment and into what you're feeling. Um, and emotions, I actually wrote this down. The According to the book Discovering Psychology, so this is kind of the psychological idea of what emotions are. Um, an emotion is a complex psychological state that involves three distinct components. So this I thought was interesting. So it's a subjective experience, a physiological response, and a behavioral or experience expressive response. So those are the three parts that psychology says make up an emotion. So even psychologists have recognized that this emotion, this kind of psychic state, if you like, is not just a psychic state. It actually permeates into your physiology, into your physical cells. So that for me was kind of like, okay, so we've known this for so long. Why isn't there more talk about emotions why isn't there more or why aren't there more people discussing how emotions can be managed why aren't we talking about you know the fact that it's natural to be angry um, but it's how you express that anger and how it's follow, how you follow through with your anger that is actually kind of the more important thing you know that thing needs to be processed that anger needs to be processed now we can process it by blowing up in somebody's face and shouting loads of abuse at them and being really really angry and and letting our vocabulary you know our vocabulary really express that for us some people say nothing and just lash out and just you know their physicality takes over for them from from their, their rational minds if you like and it's straight into a punch or a kick or a hit or a smack and you know not necessarily somebody else but a wall you know they might get really angry and throw something um you know it it asks to be expressed immediately immediately and in that respect there are a lot of i mean there are a lot of different emotions I tried to pinpoint how many emotions um, scientists have kind of come up that we, you know, we express. And the common thread that kept coming up was uh, seven or eight emotions, which seemed to be very, very basic for me um, when I thought about the range of emotions that I feel like I express. I didn't think there was kind of like, like seven or eight, but I suppose if you want to just kind of compartmentalize and, you know, make it kind of a basic understanding, um, then you don't want to kind of get too far into it. But one of the the studies that I kind of read across was about 27 emotions that humans feel. So starting from um, the top, and it's, it's in, 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 in uh, alphabetical order, you've got admiration, adoration, aesthetic appreciation, amusement, anxiety, awe, awkwardness, boredom, confusion, craving, disgust, empathetic pain, Entrancement, envy, excitement, fear, horror, interest, joy, nostalgia, romance, sadness, satisfaction, sexual desire, sympathy, and triumph. So that was kind of the list of 27 emotions that humans feel. I don't think that's necessarily complete, but that's where we are. What the two, I think, emotions that were kind of missing off of there, the kind of more obvious ones that I was quite surprised weren't listed down there, was the two kind of the basics, love and hate. Um, and so I did a little bit of kind of Googling on hate and whether or not it's actually considered to be an emotion. Because um, I feel like love is so complex. Um, but then hate is as well. Hate, the psychological response for hate or the psychological explanation for hate was really um, an amalgamation of a lot of these emotions that I've just read out, you know, and forming into kind of a fear-based um, response that, you know, was really more detrimental. This was, and this was kind of what was key in the psychological side of it, was super much, much, much more detrimental to the person feeling it than the person receiving it. And again, this to me was kind of like, a, you know, OK, well, we really need to be talking about emotions. We need really need to be thinking about emotions. There need to be there needs to be a dialogue opened about emotions and about how we can cope with our own emotions and how we can manage our own emotions and what healthy and unhealthy emotions might look like, you know, might feel like rather um, opposed to kind of, you know, just the idea 
that um you know oh if you're experiencing this that could be that you know and if you're experiencing this that could be that one of my friends um another one of my friends has just recently had this weird thing happen with her mouth the inside of her mouth's gone really really dry really inflamed very very sensitive uh, to the point where even her lips have kind of swollen up her bottom lip particularly is sort of swollen up and she has gone to the doctor two or three times now she's had second opinions um they basically sort of said don't worry about it too much it could be this it could be that um we're not really sure we'll do a couple of tests um but probably nothing much to worry about it should go away um now whether or not that sort of you know the, the tests will reveal anything i think what one of the things that I know, she, you know, she sort of felt was it, it could be related to stuff that she's been feeling and, and dealing with um, because she's had a lot on her plate recently um, and she's been dealing with a lot of stress. And again, stress that is caused, yes, by work and the kids and, and relationships, and all that sort of thing, but also stress from her past, stress that, uh, you know, stressful emotion that she hasn't really processed, stuff that kind of has been wedged away for a while that has um been required to be kind of looked at again and in, in, like recently and i felt like that was kind of again very indicative of what's going on in her life as well and the, the things that she's been experiencing because she's not been able to say how she really really feels um she's kind of very much kept those feelings to herself and try to cope with things that other people may have crumbled under for the sake of her boys for the sake of her family you know those sorts of things she just really hasn't experienced the depth of the grief that she's been feeling the loss that she's been feeling um you know other feelings that are surrounded by that loss as i spoke um at the beginning of the show you know through my own experience of of loss and, and of grief i recognize how many layers there are to it right now i'm I'm feeling the loss as a hole in the heart from someone who just isn't there anymore. But there will be other layers. I'm, I'm very aware there will be other things that will come up for me um, as I process this grief. And I need to be aware of it. I need to be present of it. I need to be there dealing with it. You know, it's no good hiding away and, and kind of waiting for it to pass, if you like. Emotions are things that are designed to draw your attention to something to let you know that you're feeling something about this situation that you're in, um, designed to get you to respond, to design to get you to think differently about a situation, to design to get you to empathize, to get, kind of get you to, to reach back into those other emotions that, that we all have um, and be able to respond through them and demonstrate them as well so that you can have that experience. Um, I believe that life, is really one huge experience that we are um, we're put here to kind of go through so that we can learn so that we can feel so that we can uh, begin to recognize the oneness if you like in our universe the you know the the obvious duality of things just gives you kind of like the middle base and so that's kind of that's my own personal belief about kind of why we're here and certainly emotions really help me bring logic into that because if we didn't have emotions we wouldn't feel things and feeling is such a huge part of our life isn't it when you think about it it affects so many different things you know it affects the people that you have around you it affects um the way you start your day you know if you start your day like you know we'd say you've got out bed the wrong side don't you if you kind of come downstairs and, and you're a bit grouchy and you're a bit down or you're a bit moody or you're a bit angry or you're a bit whatever you know it's like oh he or she's got out of bed the, the, the wrong side today haven't they and it's about how your emotions almost have come to you straight away with your day you know something has triggered that emotion and it might be something that you dreamt about it might be from something from yesterday or last week that you still haven't processed and it's it's on your mind it's, it's there within you kind of nagging away um and, you know, it, they can be things that are kind of always asking you to think about other people, you know, like worry, um, you know, all the different, the kind of the different fears and anxiety and 
uh, you know, all those sorts of things that you feel when you're in the emotion, um, you know, really enable you to feel things that, you know, feel empathy, for example, you know, that this emotion, to feel that, to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand how they might be feeling. And what a beautiful emotion that is to be able to have control over, you know. Um, amusement, awkwardness, you know, the, the just two that kind of popped out at me then, like amusement, being able to kind of laugh with and at people all together, you know, brings a feeling, a communal feeling of joy, brings a feeling of, you know, a united front type thing as well. If you're all kind of laughing at the same thing, then it's a really, it's a bonding experience. You know, again, you're kind of touching base and you're feeling into your community. So that's really, really important. Um, nostalgia, being able to look back and look back with love, you know, look back with, um, you know, the idea that that was kind of, you know, good times and, you know, all those memories that you've created are positive memories for you to be carrying through with you. But also things like, you know, um, disgust. When you look at something and you just feel repelled, um, you feel, you know, like, again, that physical response to, I mean, I'm literally, I can feel my face contorting into kind of a, a sort of a, a disgusted face, if you like, you know, where you're just appalled by what's going on or by a certain, um, you know, something someone said, um, you know, all those sorts of things. You can really kind of feel that and be, you know, appalled at, at, at the way people will behave and the, the, the way that that comment, for example, has made you feel. Um, and these are things that you do definitely feel physically. So again, amalgamating that with our chakra knowledge and looking at, you know, when, okay, so if you don't speak your truth, then what is it that, you know, that you're then bringing into your physical body? Because you know from, you know, your mind, if you like, and your, and your very soul that you want to say something, but you stop, you press it down, you suppress it, you don't speak your truth. And that will have a physiological effect on you. So we know that. But what is the physiological effect? How close is it? How direct is it? You know, what difference is that going to make to your throat, to that whole area there? You know, what what how how what effect will that have? And I kind of you know start to think about well if you can't speak your truth and you can't be honest, then how will your voice be heard? That that's a lack of self-worth, that's a lack of confidence, a lack of self-esteem. You know, it's a lot of stuff going around the throat chakra. If you can't speak your truth and you speak your mind, you don't feel like your voice is being heard. You don't feel like you're worth your voice being heard, you know. And this is, again, another thing that kind of set me off about thinking about how strong and how powerful and how necessary it is to do internal work on emotions um, was the fact that actually, yeah, and if you're suppressing all those things, then you're inviting another host of emotions in where you really can develop a lot of negative self-talk around your experiences uh, and around the feelings that you are having about not being able to express emotions. So, for example, you kind of might want to say, you know, like, you know, I really wasn't pleased with the way that you handled yourself in that situation, but you choose not to. So and then in your mind, you're kind of thinking, you know, I really should say something about that. I really didn't think that was on. And, you know, I just think I should kind of reflect that back. And then the other little voice saying, you know, and no one's really interested in what you're going to say. You're going to say something about that, Kirsten. It's just going to become, you know, confrontational. You're going to have an argument. You know, you don't want an argument. It's all calmed down a little bit now. Why bother? You know, sort of those sorts of things. Then you might have this other voice sort of saying to you, what do you mean, why bother? You know, it's important that you say what's on your mind. It's important that, you know, they understand where you're coming from. It's important that your voice is heard. Your voice is just as important as everybody else's. Your opinion is just as important as everybody else's. Are you going to let them just kind of get away with that? You're going to let them just kind of trample all over you and you're just going to sit back and go, okay, well, I don't want to get into a confrontation. Therefore, I'm just kind of not going to say anything. So all this kind of negative self-thought then, you know, all these negative voices that are going on in your mind, challenging you to perhaps step up and do what you want to do, but also talking you in and around that for ease, for comfort. It's your comfort zone, right? Not to necessarily say something. If you're in a happy place, you don't want to upset that apple cart. You know, why would you? We're all guilty of it. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of like got to thinking about then, so you don't speak your truth. So you hold on to 
the words, the feelings, the emotion that's kind of held there. And then what happens? You know, that emotion just what? You know, because you're going to have to speak again. So your voice is going to have to clear, and it, and it always does. You know, you're going to have to process stuff. So you're going to have to kind of go through that. But what about, what about physically what happens to your emotions? Where then are you affected physically if your voice isn't heard? And if you don't speak your mind, you know, what can you say? How can you, how can you really get past that? and back into a place of balance where you can calm the voices in your mind and you can understand that actually, you know, you might have had something to say, um, but you chose not to. You chose to not upset other people, not upset that apple cart. And so that's your choice. But to what cost, to what end was it to your choice? You know, I feel like there isn't enough knowledge on emotions there isn't enough practical stuff going on about emotions either you know people aren't really able to find out a lot of information i mean there's a there's a there's a quite a fair amount of information on you know the internet about um about chakras about you know health of various parts um but it really kind of got me thinking and so I wrote and I did about some other little things. So I've got here what happens when you let chronic stress and negative emotions affect your body. So this is kind of if you don't press it, this is what happens if you suppress that throat chakra around that area. So I'm going to go into, I'm going to read the brain and the mouth as well as the lungs because I kind of think they're all integrated. So the brain, it says chronic stress can lead to poor concentration, low mood, personality changes and may even damage brain cells okay so oh, excuse me. we know that it's um we know that it's dangerous to be in that constant state of stress you know the mind uh, is a hugely powerful organ in the body we don't want to keep that in chronic stress you know we don't want to keep that so that you have very little concentration that you are constantly kind of moving from pillar to post um you know low moods no one wants to be low, low or moody. Um, personality changes and may even damage brain cells. So I would hazard a guess that when you stop any energy center in your body from moving, there is going to be some damage because there almost always is. When you change the nature of something, everything around it changes. So I would guess that when you're kind of putting stress, you know, like my husband did, putting stress on your on your voice box, um, that when you're putting stress, emotional stress into that area as well, it damages the skin cells there. It damages the area around and within that chakra. So that in itself, when you're talking about your mouth, you know, and I'm thinking about my friend here, with her, um, you know, with her inflamed mouth and all those sorts of things. You know, she said when she was able to kind of talk to me for the first time in a long time, that actually alleviated a lot of her problems. Not because I'd said anything, just the fact that she'd had somebody to listen. She'd had somebody to hear what it was that she wanted to say. Um, you know, she'd been given permission to do that. And she felt confident now, more confident going forward um, and to, you know, to speak again. So. Then if you look at the mouth, thinking about how her mouth inflamed and the, the tongue flaming, that sort of thing, it says the mouth ulcers, dryness, and even speech impediments can be affected by chronic stress. So it's saying that, you know, if you've got stress and that's how you're choosing to express it through your voice, through your, uh, you know, your larynx, through your, your throat chakra, oh, excuse me. then... When that gets stuck, when that stuff that you can't say gets stuck, what? My question. I had my right knee swell up when we were on holiday. And there was no reason for it whatsoever. We'd literally just been down the beach the day before. I'd had a particularly lazy one kind of just lying there watching my husband building sandcastles and the kids running in and out of the sea and, and playing on boogie boards and stuff like that. There was no reason 
excuse me, oh dear me, sorry. There was no reason for my right knee to swell up, and yet swell up it did, or, you know, in a matter of hours. And I was really miffed. I was kind of thinking, God, that's annoying, because I, you know, I wanted to practice my yoga, but I, I tend not to when anything's inflamed, and it was quite inflamed, you know. It was, it was kind of, you know, stiff feeling when I moved my knee. Um, you could feel the kind of the edema, the, the, the water retention around that knee that the, you know, that the skin's brought in to protect it. And it really kind of threw me, um, both personally and professionally. So I didn't really do anything too much. I kind of thought I must have sprained it the day before or something, you know, done something. Um, I'll find out. It'll be good. It'll be, oh, excuse me. It'll be fine. Um, and then three days later, it wasn't. Three days later, it was still very swollen. I'd been kind of putting on my essential oils, trying to bring that down, and that had brought a lot of respite, um, a lot of feeling better, um, a lot of kind of open open dialogue about things as well, which was, was something I needed. Um, but also, it's kind of, I've gotten to the point where I was, what, why has this manifest like this? Why have I got this big swollen knee on the right hand side? So again, I googled and I came up with um, a list actually of why the right knee would swell. Um, so I'm going to try and find some of the key points that I wrote down. Um, talking about, oh, excuse me, talking about um, your knees and the right knee particularly specifically it was talking about um, how I was struggling to res respond to authority I was struggling to move into a different area of life that wasn't enabling me to continue doing the stuff that I previously did um, it's also linked to moving forward um, and into a place of transition or change that you're just not comfortable with. Um, and it was also about, what was the other thing that was kind of stepping forward into your integrity, um, you know, being true to who you are. And that was all very indicative to me, like the idea that, um, you know, I needed to kind of really step into my integrity and stand there tall and say, yes, actually, this is what I you know, this is what I believe, this is what I am uh, currently kind of doing and working on and all that sort of thing, it was very, very important to me. And I hadn't been doing it. You know, my my niece rolled up, swell up probably about seven days in, you know, six, seven, eight days in. Um, and it wasn't gone until day 11, 12, I would say. Um and so, yeah, I was looking for like the reasons that this the knee would have swollen up. And I, I came across all these amazing reasons, all these things that kind of just were like tick, tick, tick. You know, no wonder I'm kind of suffering from this. But what can I do to shift here on its way? You know, I've, I've had it for three days. I'm, the doctors haven't given me anything. They've just basically said that, um, you know, it is what it is. Um, and so I just need to kind of deal with it. Um, and like leg up, rest the knee, nothing to, ex you know, no, no exertions or anything like that. Um, just, you know, just keep resting and, and, you know, it'll go down and then just be really mindful of how you use it. Okay, great. So then I read about muscles and emotions. So it says negative emotions are stored in tension in muscles and can lead to muscle spasms, chronic pain, fatigue, even ticks and tremors. So bearing in mind, this was kind of all around my right kneecap. Um, and I was reading that the right knee was all about stepping forward into a new business area, um, stepping forward into an area of your life where you know you need to change it, where you're feeling uh, unsupported in your decisions as well was another one that I find, kind of felt was, yeah, absolutely, you know, having to shelve everything that I do for that month was actually quite hard for me. I was really looking forward to it for such a long time. And then actually stepping out of that arena um, of working and being so involved with my clients put me on a bit of a, a backpedal, I suppose. I just felt like, you know, I was going to lose touch with them. I might lose clients because I'd taken this time off. Um, that, you know, it, it was going to very negatively affect my business. Uh, all these sorts of things, all these sorts of things that I was kind of going through. Um, and not, I wouldn't say as 
a mindful you know every second of every day I'm spending thinking about these things I, I doesn't it didn't feel like that at all but it just it's that constant sort of omnipresent idea that something is happening and something is changing and certainly I think this is kind of one of the things that we are stuck in a problem with at the moment in the western world is that we're all so easily distracted by the emotions that we're feeling and the problems that we're facing and all this sort of thing that actually we don't even fully process our emotions around this point so this is something that you know I, I kind of want to touch on like I said in a later um, episode but also you know now like be careful of how you speak to yourself. This is something that I say to my, my clients a lot. Be careful of how you speak to yourself. Because if you speak to yourself badly, then the chances are that they will speak to you badly as well. You know, I'm not talking about swearing or anything like that. I'm talking about the level of respect that comes across to you via other people through the construct of language. You know, that's, that's really, really important. It's important to have that kind of community um, and it's important to be able to kind of recognize, I think, as well, what it is that you're doing or not doing to that may or may not have fought on this problem. So we're talking about like the muscles. Um, and I really felt like this was uh, this inflammation was, again, kind of anger, frustration, um, you know, that tenseness, a constant tenseness, a, a, a building up, a blocking up, if you like. Um, and that was, you know, that was quite a good symbol for me. I kind of, I was going back and I sort of thought, okay, so this is asking me, I suppose, really to kind of slow down or to get back in. You know, slow down to the point where you're actually switching off from this stuff now and then get back into it afterwards. Um, you know, like renew, revitalize, it, you know, it'll be fine type thing. Hmm. so having looked at my knee and all the problems that I associated with it and ticking all the boxes I my next adventure in, in this little journey was to really find out what it was that I could do to alleviate then this mental emotional pressure that I was putting on my, my own body um, and a uh, lots of meditations came up lots of meditations in the end I chose one that was about rooting myself into the ground as I reached up high like a tree and really feeling kind of the rib cage expanding and closing um, and really beginning to kind of notice my physicality again in a really positive way because you know suddenly I'm achieving something um, was was really good as well so I want to I wanted to talk about why that felt good and what I think is because you begin to move that area and you begin to ignite the, the kind of the energy center that's there and it begins to kind of move again. It want, you know, it, it gone from being kind of stuck, if you like, to kind of wanting to move again, wanting to shake away the, the, the harnesses that are around it and, and, you know, and clean itself and clear itself out. And it's really, first of all, it's going to be kind of, you know, like a big cleanup message or mission, sorry how much is there to do you know how realistic is this to think that you can do it in the time frame that you've allowed because that was that was a pretty big thing for me when I was working through my emotions it was actually you know it was quite a long-winded process and things would come up to me all the time so I often felt quite um uh, I felt like I needed to get back into my line of work but I also was very mindful that I didn't want to kind of leave the kids or, or my husband off in one angle. You know, I just, yeah, I needed to find that happy balance. Um, and so I did this really beautiful meditation about um, grounding and really being where you are right now and accepting that for what it is. You know, the fact that you are there right now, that's kind of it. Um, and so, and then, but it, yeah, like I say, kind of, you know, so many things were coming up to me. I was thinking to myself, my God, like, we're really feeling this sort of stuff physically. There's huge emotion attached. No one ever talks about all this sort of thing. Um, 
the physicality side of it is to the point where you can't necessarily speak, where you actually get swellings and, you know, edema, actual flesh response to these emotions. Um, you know, I've got my friend Emma, who's, um, you know, experiencing kind of this pain in her mouth because of repressed emotions and not being able to kind of, again, speak her truth and say what's really on her mind. Um, and the more she's been doing that, you know, I've been encouraging her to do that. And other people have said the same thing. So, you know, encouraging her to speak her mind and she sort of feels like actually I might it might be coming down a little bit now it's not quite as harsh as it was it's still swollen it still feels raw in my mouth but I do notice that there is some sort of change um so that's kind of really important as well um there's lots of things that you know there's there's so much information on the internet about what you can isolate all the different areas and, and what you can isolate in these different areas. So do do your own research. Um, emotional energy centers of the body, I basically Googled. Um, and then it came up with all these different things. And then I went into the emotional energy centers PDF that came up and, you know, loads of sort of stuff. I Googled about the emotions humans feel and, and all those sorts of things. Um, so when I started talking to myself more kindly, when I wrote down all the things that I wanted to do when we came back from holiday. Um, and when I was uh, resting it, I suppose, I would be kind of doing some sort of energy healing. So just gently placing my hands over the top of the knee and really feeling out into that pain and, and where it originates and which part of the leg it's really directly uh, affecting and all this sort of stuff. And when I came out of my meditation, which was designed to actually let go of all the dark stuff as well, I found that, you know, I, I felt like I'd learned from the mind that I inherited with that whole experience, but that the body had somehow changed. Um, and, you know, not in a bad way, just in the fact that I felt like I was able to come more uh, into, I suppose, the reality of what it means to suppress things in your life you know at some point it's going to come up to be recognized and my right knee is actually you know the one part of my body that keeps stressing me out if you like keeps um, upsetting me because every now and again it will just it will go it will flare up and then give it a couple of days and it'll go back down again and until I start to explore the relationship between emotions and the psychical self I really didn't have much of an idea of how interlinked that they were um, and now, of course, I do. It's it's just opened a massive can of worms. And to be honest with you, it's fascinating. So I just want to go quickly over some of the um, other, what other blockages might cause for you in your body. And I want you to kind of sit and think about whether or not you're experiencing any of these things or whether you know somebody who perhaps experiences these things. And this is why you, you know, you've tuned in, if you like. So without further ado. This is the emotional energy centers of the body. Those are just looks like that. Uh, it says the right side is controlled by the left brain. Okay, the right masculine or yang um, symbol reflects the outer world. So the outer world. So again, I suppose looking at my knee, I'm looking at, um, you know, moving forward. Um, I'm looking at, yeah, fear in being, you know, myself in front of other people, I suppose. You know, that kind of that idea that you're just going to be judged and that they're not going to like you and that the, everything that you say is just going to be a load of rubbish, you know, all those sorts of anxieties. Um, it's very, uh, the right side of the brain is very dominating in the fact that you, it, you know, it's, it's my way or the highway type thing. Um, and I think, I think that's, I'm not sure that might just be my husband's um personality but i think that's kind of like throughout history the red has always invoked a sense of passion um and a sense of uh you know perhaps like war really in all honesty so anyway emotional parts of the sense of the body so masculine or yang is the outer world affects the outer world little side un uh, left side sorry uncontrolled by right top, right uh, oh, uncontrolled by right for sin controlled by right for sin left feminism or yin reflects the inner world okay so that's the left and the right sides of the brain and the differences that we've got between them so let's start with the right side the right side says burdens and responsibilities carrying a, carrying a heavy load 
weight of the world on your shoulders. Okay, so that's your um, right arm. That's your right arm. Then your left side is uh, insistent, uh, inner world burdens. Burdens and responsibilities carrying a heavy load, weight of the world on your shoulders again. So those were the kind of the two shoulder ones, right and left. Then if we stay on the outside edge of the body, we've got the rear tuna kips and the on the entire on the emergence level the heart can look the heart can look back black from hurt and endurance in an emotional pain right so you've got the heart center then which experiences grief and sorrow and loss loneliness of the heart lack of love sleepiness alzheimer's dns on what does that say d oh sorry dj's ominous em, embarrassment shame head nation repossessed feeling uh humiliation sorry repossessed be uh, repressed feelings disappointment genetic or ancient memory cruelty and meanness so these are all things that come into the heart center and that are also permeating out out towards the left and the right side. And I, again, I thought they were really quite interesting. You know, grief, sorrow, sadness, loss. That's the first, the first thing it all came up with. Grief, sorrow, sadness, and loss. You know, emotional emptiness of the heart, lack of love, helplessness, aloneness. You know, these are not good emotions to be having, are they? You know, these are not kind of the ones that you want to be carrying around with you all the time because think about all that negativity and what it's affecting in that part of your body now we're not talking about the throat we're not talking about how it might affect the, the, the larynx or the, the throat muscles anything like that now we're talking about the heart and the area surrounding the heart you know we're talking about the lungs we're talking about the middle back we're talking about the fact that if the hump the pump isn't uh, pumping quick enough then you're not going to be able to get your blood, blood transfusions properly you're going to be left without when you are you know using blood for medicational reasons like that sort of thing you're going to get really left out so it's important to recognize that actually this is quite a good idea you know I need to be kind of thinking about these emotions and working through them so that they're not stored anywhere. This is what I would love to see. I would love to see this dialogue open and people everywhere be able to connect in with the idea that, you know, if you don't process, process your emotions, if you choose to put them to one side, and you can do that, you can say, I'm not ready for this, you know, I, and you can put it back in the box and it'll go under the stairs and suddenly you don't have to be reminded of that. But one thing that will always remind me, I think, is how the dog, well, my dog, for example, just goes on and on to people that it that it likes and steers clear of other people. Like it's kind of reading again, reading their emotions because it's it's just time and time again. Um, so on the energetic level, the heart can look back uh, black from hurt and unresolved emotional pain. And that's interesting as well isn't it so this is actually you can see it physically the change it's not just kind of all crazy woo woo give it a go i'm sure it'll work you can actually see the emotional strain on her body um then i've got liver center and the anger center the fear center and the uh, spleen problems guilt responsibility center i can't read my eyes go a bit funny um Being able to sit with your feelings comfortably and feel all the feels is a huge deal. You think about it, you don't scrimp out of feeling joy. You don't scrimp out of feeling love. You don't scrimp out of feeling, what's the other positive ones? Let's see, excitement or romance or sympathy. But you do when it's all the negative ones. Now, why is that? Why is it that you feel like we're driving along in a car, we both leave the car at the same time, I pull out first and then my husband comes and, you know, you, there's this kind of amalgamation of emotions that are, are being felt. What's going on there, you know? Um, so I want to kind of, I want to open that dialogue now uh, and, and explore that over the next few weeks and really explore 
what it will mean to us should we hold these emotions because I recognize that when I'm feeling like guilt and stuff like that my my back plays up and sure enough true and into it here we are um spleen problems so that spleen and middle back I've got the two here I'm thinking it's probably again just that heart center chakra that heart sacral center chakra uh so you with with the heart center you've got the grief the sorrow the sadness the loss with the spleen you've got guilt responsibility center so this is on the left side um you know that's where your spleen is it's self-judgment self-criticism not deserving of the good life has for us and instability to that's uh, sorry, inability to accept and receive so that really hits home to me you know all those things throughout my life there have been very many times when i felt very very guilty that i felt judged that i have noticed that my mind has been is being super super critical about the way i look or what i'm doing or you know any of those sorts of things um not observing of the good life has for us yeah well i think do you know what i think when you're depressed and you're suffering some some sort of mental issue um you know you don't often see the beauty that is surrounding you every day i would say that it's probably like a telltale sign actually if, if you're with somebody and they feel like they're down and they're just not able to appreciate a really beautiful place off their own back not just like yeah all right yeah you know it's good should we go here should we do this should we go that okay fine you know i would like to know that going forward from this conversation that we're that we're opening people are beginning to think about the centers that are being affected the chakras that are being affected where those are located and what organs are directly affected because of the imbalance in the chakras so carrying on we've got liver problems the anger center anger and rage anger at others anger at uh, anger at self due um jealousy and resentment so uh, yeah i mean liver problems i've always wondered why it is that as a culture the english drink so much like i'm not a massive drinker myself at all i i barely drink um i've always been a designated driver i've always been the person who will get everybody home you know i i've always taken on that role and if i'm honest with you i've quite enjoyed that role you know, I've enjoyed knowing that the people that I love, that I love in this world, or some of the you know the people that I love in this world, are still safe and are still you know kicking on, and it's all good and all the rest of it. Um, but I have a lot of I personally have guilt in my back. I can feel it. I know it. I think I've released some of it. I think I've got guilt that's surrounding lots of things that happened a long time ago as well. So I feel like when I look at myself and I talk about, um, you know, this pain and why I've got it and what it's trying to show me and what is the lesson in this in meditation, I'd often get a little drop in voice of my own that says, oh, remember about this, remember about that. Um, and actually when I read that the middle back was all about guilt um, and uh, unacceptance, self-judgment, self-criticism, um, inability to accept the good that life has to offer. That really, really reminded me of going to see my nana because my nana passed away 2013, so seven years ago now, from Alzheimer's. Um, and it was such a generative, degenerative disease that it was really quite horrifying to watch. I say fortunately, but fortunately, I was living in Thailand at the time. Um, so I was only really watching it like once a year when I came back and I would go up there and spend a day or a day a, two, a couple of days up with her. Um, and it really was uh, it really was a bit of a kind of a a nightmare when it came to her funeral. They sent me this link that I was going to be able to kind of go into like a, effectively a Zoom meeting, but I couldn't get any decent internet anywhere that I went. And I didn't want to kind of go to a cafe. You know, I thought it was going to be quite an emotional time anyway. Um, my dad also asked me, because I, I wrote quite a lot of poetry, and my dad always said to me, you know, you're really good with words, Curse. Will you write something for Nana's funeral? Um, and I just, I couldn't. I was in such a bad space, I just couldn't find it within me to write anything. Um, 
you know, she she tried to give me a couple of bits, a couple of hands. Meanwhile, you know, my mum, who didn't really used to write too much at all, is now back out writing. And she WhatsApped me to say, oh, I'm really, really well reading now and, and doing my apps and doing this and that and the other. And, you know, we had this like, little conversation about, like, you know, how oh, brilliant, mum, that's great. I'm so glad you had something to do, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the guilt that I was feeling around my nana specifically, not being able to get there, um, and when I eventually did go, I just grabbed a spoon out of the cupboard and, and just went, you know, and this spoon just turned out to be a little teaspoon, you know, around that sort of size. And I just, you know, I crumbled really, like it was just all too much. So I have, um, I have an experience, if you like, about how the responsibility and the guilt and all those sorts of things, actually, when I used it for my advantage, it did, in fact, work. You know, I said to Nathan already, you know, you need to go up, you need to do this. Come on, don't make mummy wait, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, yeah, so that was kind of, that was that was interesting to me, the, uh, the being able to ascertain which parts of your body are suffering, perhaps because of the lifestyle that you lived up until that point. Um, and that's the other thing as well. It's everything's up until that point because you can only ever start from now. So it's really about looking at where you're experiencing pain if you're still in, in, experiencing pain in your body and then looking at one of these charts um, and finding out what it could be. Now you don't have to, it doesn't have to be an exact science. It's just what it could be. What it, What is it that makes it feel like it might be that or it might be from so and so or it might be from so and so so and so you know like just being able to kind of touch base like that with people um can often jig memories um and you know your stimuli for for holding on to this so when i put my shoulder out in rishikesh and yoga when i was doing my yoga teacher training and i couldn't teach for five days I think it was and I was driving myself absolutely mental and then I had a beautiful sit down with one of the gurus there who basically sort of said to me you know you don't put yourself in danger for yoga yoga will always be there you don't have to put yourself out or put yourself into some sort of weird danger as well um you know it, you just it, it it is what it is so I wonder as well then things like when you're constantly dousing stuff down your larynx or you're stuff you're taking stuff and that sort of thing. What about smoking? What about giving up something like that as well? If you've got your two lanes, it narrows down to one. When you get past the roundabout, it now it's narrowed down already again. Just do the two rounds of sun salutations or something like that to get you going. Um, and you feel like you're in that zone. So one of the other things that we were kind of looking at then when I, I, I got into, uh, you know, really moving that energy then was how it felt to move it and what it brought up. And I was very, very carefully watching my thought process uh, because I, I recognized that, that was guilt and I was very much kind of moving, you know, watching my thought processes to see as to what sort of guilt that was. You know, it's been a fair few times in my life when I felt guilty uh, over relationship breakups and not going to see my nana, you know, as much as I could possibly because we were living in Thailand, you know, not sorting certain things out, the way I've treated people in the past, you know. We, we all carry a lot of this sort of stuff around with us. Um, and being able to move my body and, and really focus in on asanas, particularly that were going to be chest opening, heart opening, um, you know, moving up and down the spine so that that sort of stuff might get released. Um, I got, you know, very good at listening to my thoughts and recognizing what it is that I was kind of feeling um, and thinking at that time. And guilt was the thing that came up very, very heavily. It was actually I felt guilty for past relationships specifically, um, the way I'd handled it. Um, and I felt guilty about my nana. And she was the first one that came up. So I had this experience in, in India when I was, when I was, um, doing my teacher training and it really threw me I you know I didn't know I was supposed to be there for teacher training and I couldn't lift my arm above my shoulder you know it was so tight across my middle back um, and so my guru sent me to a Ayurvedic massage or masseuse who just literally pressed this point in between my shoulder blades and when it's there and I was kind of like oh yeah that's exactly where it is that's that's the point exactly 
okay, fine. So you've got me, you know, I had to take my top off and got me laid out on a kind of a wooden table and, you know, began to kind of work things through. And when he hit this point again, it released this huge sort of whizzing feeling that came up from my middle back all the way up the back of my neck and into my brain. And un it was under my skull. I could totally feel that it was into my brain. Um, so no sort of fleshy response. It wasn't a fleshy response. This was very much either a nervous or an energy response. Um, that's what I felt like it was. And it shifted something. And I couldn't stop crying. I just was crying and crying and crying. And it just started. It was like my eyes started to leak. Um, and I kind of apologized. And he said, oh, don't worry. You know, often I'm really, you know, releasing stuff and, and this will happen. Don't worry about it. So I felt fine. But I had to continue with that massage for about another 10 minutes. And I was getting myself into more and more of a state. I couldn't stop crying. The emotion that was coming from me was coming through thick and fast. You know, I was finding it, I was finding it hard to sort of stay, you know, bear in mind, I'm lying on a table, you know, a wooden table in India, having this guy sort of prod me and poke me and pull me around. And all I could think about was, you know, my God, my nose is going to be dripping onto the table. It's like it's a puddle. I'm lying on a puddle. It was all around my cheek. Um, and I just really, really wanted to stop crying, but there was no stopping it. It was like he pressed a button that said, release emotion. And, and there it was. And I kind of struggled through the last 10 minutes of the massage, paid him, apologized profusely, and went scurrying back to my room. I literally had like a scarf over my head. I was kind of, you know, just so upset and just like, oh, scurrying back to my room like that, that, I, that no one would see me. Um, and see me expressing this emotion again, like, you know, that was crazy to me as well, looking back. Um, and when I got back, home, oh, got back home, when I got back to my room, I let it all out. I really sobbed. Um, and there's only been a couple of times in my life when I've really, really kind of sobbed, you know, that heart racking, that chest wavering sob. Um, and just let everything out, everything that I was feeling. And all the time, throughout all that emotional release, I was picturing my Nana's face. I was feeling the love that I had for her. You know, we were, we were, we were close. You know, she was very similar to me. Um, and I, I was allowing myself to really feel that. As I was letting go of the emotion, all this stuff was coming into my mind. And all these feelings were coming through my body. And it was, you know, it was kind of, it, it felt like a very cathartic release felt like it's something that I'd needed to do um, and it had been sparked by kind of this pressure point on my back in between underneath my right shoulder funnily enough so if we look at the right side um, and we're looking at relationships so yeah fight or flight response I can't really read these it doesn't say really anything about that let's see on my other one on the right side which is this side so uh okay interesting fear center fears and phobias loss of control fear of losing control giving our power to another person relationships um in between sort of shame humiliation repressed feelings disappointments um interestingly enough as well genetic or ancient memory so stuff coming through from past lives as well perhaps cruelty meanness uh, anger and then from the anger center anger at others anger at self jealousy and resentment so all of those kind of things amalgamating into this one area and then when it was released it was just this huge cathartic let go of feeling that I had um, and like I say I had all these visions of my nana and the story gets even crazier actually because as I got up um, I went in to, to wash my face I was sitting in, in this so my room was right at the very, very back of the ashram that I was staying um, and completely concrete locked, you know, right in the very, very middle. And I got up to wash my face in the, the sink there, the, like the little ensuite bathroom that I had. And as I looked into the sink bowl, there was a tiny little caterpillar going around the, the plug hole, like so just circling the, the, the plug hole. And, and I didn't turn the water on. I just was absolutely gobsmacked to see it there. Like this was kind of, you know, real crazy thing. Like, how did this caterpillar get in? You know, there's no windows, there's no plants around where I live. You know, where, where, how did that get in there? Um, and it kind of became a little bit of a symbol to me because I immediately responded in, in mind and in thought with, you know, well, well that'll be Nana. You know, that that'll be her saying that she's here and she's with me and 
and, and all those sorts of things, which as crazy as that might sound, from other experiences that I've had in my life, I recognize that, you know, energy stay around. People's energy will be will stay with you a certain level. I mean, metaphysical, quantum, you know, all those sorts of sciences really ask you to expand your mind past this singular dimension that we're living in. Um, and there's again, this is another one for an, another much longer show um, and I'll bring in some resource I think if we get into quantum creating because I know just the man just popped into my mind but I you know I find that in that sense you know I, I I go with whatever comes to me now I've learned to really trust my intuition and trust my feelings and trust all the messages that come through to me um, and so when I'm associating that in, in my mind and in my heart with my nana that's what it's become to me whether or you know whether or not that sounds crazy or not that's what it is for me and and essentially in my reality that that's really all that matters right so I'm watching this little thing going round and round and round I'm just thinking oh my god that's like that's crazy you know that's that just feels like it's all about Nana and 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 she's here and she's letting me know that she's been here and she's heard and she's recognized and all those sorts of things so that was really really nice as well um and that pain in my back subsided considerably after letting go of all that stuff I still couldn't move my arm up higher than kind of it is now um you know I, I couldn't have stretched upright for example it was just kind of about there but I was able to kind of move it and manipulate it and I went back for 10 days following that day and had a massage every day and that was the only time that I had this huge emotional response where I just couldn't stop crying um, and I recognized that it was all about my Nana and grief and the sense of loss that I really hadn't acknowledged. Um, and for whatever reason, that not that kind of manifestation of upset, you know, that, that physical manifestation of upset and, 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 and guilt had made into kind of a little ball that really needs to be broken down. So over the next 10 days, he was constantly working that area. He said it was either a big kind of ball about like that big um, and that he was just going to kind of keep working on it and keep pressuring it. And, you know, I was doing all these certain things like lots of drink, lots of water and, and get this herb and stuff that he recommended. And I can't quite remember now, but anyway, we went back and went over it all. Um, and that for me was, I suppose, the first time when I really began to recognize that emotions are stored in your body. Um, and, you know, it's this is deep stuff. You know, my Nana died that year, but she'd been ill for five years previous to that. Um, there had been other stuff going around her death as well. But certainly, you know, that for me was a very poignant time and a time that I released a lot of the physical emotion that I'd been carrying, as well as, you know, really processing some of the emotions that I that I was experiencing at that time as well. So that was really kind of interesting to me. Um, I kind of went through a lot of research doing like, you know, talking about like looking at emotions and how they're held in the body. And apart from the, the stuff that you know, I'm reading out to you now. I got a lot of kind of drop-ins coming into it as well. So I'll, I'll go into those a little bit, you know, perhaps later on or on, on the next show. So I just want to continue with what happens when you let chronic stress and negative emotions affect your body. Okay, this is the stuff that we know happens. This is kind of the stuff that's already been released in terms of what you know happens to your body. So we've, we've already gone through the brain. We've touched on the mouth, the reproductive organs. So this is, you know, your your um, your ability to reproduce. This is a creative sense a, a, a part of you as well. If we look at the solar plexus that this refers to, it refers to, uh, sorry, at the chakra that this refers to, you're very much looking at the, um, sacral chakra which is fluidity pleasure sense of self and the solar plexus chakra which is will purpose strength and creativity around that area you know the reproductive organs are all centered around those two chakras so it said um, recurrent vaginal infections problems with getting pregnant giving birth disruptive menstrual cycles are issues in women impotence and premature ejaculation can result in men so from holding any negative emotion around those two chakra points, which respond to 
um, will, purpose, strength, creativity, fluidity, pleasure, sense of self. Um, you know, quite there's quite a few that could get challenged around that. I mean, sense of self, um, even if you look just as women at a historical level, on a historical level, you look at the sense of self, women have not been championed particularly over the last few millennia. You know, we've actually been looked at as the the lesser species if you like or the lesser sex um and the, you know that's i feel like those sorts of things you know uh, permeate through and, and make you feel challenged in your sense of self in the sense of who you are you know as a child as a young child you kind of grow up with the idea that there's really no difference between you and boys um if you you know i, I teach like uh two three four year olds and they have no idea about boy and girl stuff apart from the fact that you know there, there's a there's a fundamental difference they go to the toilet differently and stuff like that you know they know those sorts of things but they really have no idea about you know like sexism or or any differences between the sexes or anything like that um they are probably getting into the differing roles that um we're conditioned to kind of jump into as men and women they're probably already moving into those roles because they'll be demonstrated at home they'll be impacted on again at school and all those sorts of things but uh yeah, yeah right now not so much but as you as you're growing up certainly and as you're beginning to seek out your sense of self who you are who you believe yourself to be you know any stress as you're coming into those years you think about the teenage years for example um, when there's a lot of development going on and, you know, you're really begin beginning to become very finitely aware of yourself um, aesthetically and internally as well. You know, the sorts of things that you like, but certainly nowadays anyway, you know, kids are so obsessed with what they, they look like and, and all that sort of thing that, that any negative stress around that area can very heavily impact on the tissue in that problem there as well. And you may find that girls growing up then are having, you know, more painful periods, um, that boys may be experiencing, you know, kind of some problem in that area as well, whether it be to, uh, you know, about kind of, um, well, it suggests here, um, impotence and premature ejac ejaculation so you know if you're kind of your son or daughter is experiencing that sort of thing you know always look to stress as a potential cause of that especially in the teenage years when everything seems to get more stressful for everybody concerned anyway moving on from the reproductive organs we come to the muscles so negative emotions are stored as tension in muscles and can lead to muscle spasms spasms sorry chronic pains uh, fatigue even ticks and tremors so it, i think that's pretty self-explanatory you know we know that we hold tension in muscles the majority of people have a massage and they'll be like oh i'm so tense here there here there here there you know i know certainly when it's a cold day outside you know which you know stresses me because it's cold it's cold, but I'm like, Oof. tend to all go like that and it all is held in the muscles and when i come in from my walk or whatever it is that i've been doing and come into a nice warm house and just relax something like wow i've been holding myself tense for all that time you know, all that time just been kind of, that's me, that's been me. So you can see where all this sort of stuff comes from. Skin and hair, eczema, acne, psoriasis can be triggered by negative emotions and periods of chronic stress. High stress levels can cause hair loss and even baldness. So um, certainly eczema um, and uh, cirrhosis are very definitely caused by stress. Um, I used to have eczema as a kid. Um, and I grew out of it by about the, the time I was about eight, I think. And like, I don't really, you know, I remember my mum putting calamine lotion on my wrists and on the backs of my legs uh, and a little bit under my neck, I think, as well. Um, but I don't really remember, you know, well, I don't remember being stressed at that stage. Oh, excuse me. But I do remember when I was stressed um, in a previous relationship that, really blowing up my eczema really coming back with a vengeance and i don't remember it ever being so itchy scratchy um so that was quite interesting for me to read that as well because i could never really pinpoint why that ex why my eczema had come back at that particular moment um and when i, I suppose when i think back about it it's actually like actually it was quite a stressful a stressful time for me you know a lot going on um and you know outside of my relationship and within my relationship I wasn't particularly happy so I can see kind of why that that initial thing might have sort of sprung back up again you know that 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 
uh, eczema, especially because it's on the skin. The skin is all about your environment. You know, it's all about reacting to the environment around you. That's its role. Um, to relax, react to the environment around you and to sense and give you fair warning if there's something there that it's concerned about. You know, that's kind of its role. So you can see why the skin would react there. Um, lungs, chronic stress can trigger asthma, asthmatic symptoms like wheezing and bronchiodilation. Again, when you calm down, when you de-stress, if you like, it means that all the vascular tissues and the tiny little um, vascular arteries and veins and, and, and whatnot, they can let go just a little bit. When you're relaxed, everything's relaxed, remember, in your body. So when you're tight up as well, everything else is going to tighten. So something that you can feel is that tightening of the airwaves, is that tightening of the... Um, of the lungs of you know any feeling tight across your chest where you really talk, you're really gasping for breath or you're taking a real deep breath in then you've got the heart so it says excessive adrenaline and cortisol production from the negative uh, emotions and stress can lead to hypertension cardiovascular disease putting a strain on your heart so just from kind of being in hugely emotional situations all the time or making things emotional is detrimental to your heart. And therefore, if it's detrimental to your heart, then really it's detrimental to your whole circulatory system because obviously the heart is the kind of the big bad boy who pumps it all kind of around. So if he's only working or she's only working on, you know, half level, then you're going to be experiencing some changes and some kind of weird feelings perhaps where she's not able to get the blood round quite as thick as you might like quite as quickly as you might like it to then after the heart we've got digestive tract um, and i think we all are aware that we keep our emotions around our digestive tract you know you've got the solar plexus there we've talked about the butterflies in the stomach you know we've all kind of had that feeling we've all been nervous and recognized it's affected there um, maybe to the point even as well where you kind of you might have quick trip to the toilet and it's like you know emergency evacuation stage um, because you just something is going on around there and it's clearing a path for whatever needs to happen next um, so we've got digestive tract negative emotions keeps the body in stress mode directing blood flow away from the digestion this can lead to digestive uh, disorders like indigestion ibs and express acid causing heartburn and even more and even ulcers so all those sorts of things all those sort of stresses on your life when, when they affect your digestive tract you can feel them in those sorts of ways um and i think vasoconstriction uh, is a very easy is a very good one to remember because if you think about you know when you get stressed you might go like that with your hands right and that's exactly what your arteries are doing it's exactly what your capillaries are doing that's exactly what your veins are doing you know they're they're all constantly pushing the the blood around your system once it's picked up the air once it's picked up the nutrients from the stomach that sort of things all constantly being pushed, pushed around your system and it's important i think to understand that that system that whole system will be affected when you're in a level of stress especially if you're in a level of stress with your main caregiver or somebody who you you know usually around for you you know that will be a lot you know a lot to deal with so we've got all these negative emotions um like constant negative emotions leads to chronic stress high blood pressure uh, vasoconstriction heart disease meta metabolic diseases uh emotional eating disorders and autoimmune diseases um and then you've got the kind of the more positive emotions like uh, releasing the more positive side to expressing your emotions which means that they release serotonin which is a chemical that brings on kind of joy in the brain. Um, dopamine and help improved vasio, vasio oh God, I can't even say the word. What is it? Vasoconstriction uh, help with lowering our blood pressure, better digestion, eating like uh, easier life, and better inability to deal with periods of stress. So that sounds good. <laughs> um, let's keep on that one on the positive emotion. And so I'm going to finish for today and we're going to talk about next week. I want to talk about exactly, you know, how your emotions can affect you. Today we've talked about the fact that they definitely are ingrained in our physicality. 
Um, and so you can feel that physical presence of them. Like I said about my shoulder, um, I said about my pain in my, you know, in the middle back. I talked to you about my knee going forward as well. Um, there's there's a fair amount of things actually that I notice uh, in my physical self. It just it just tips the balance out out of sync for me. Um, and so it, it's obvious to me that we carry our emotions um, in our body and that we respond very physically to our emotions um, and that they can be released when there's intention um, and with, you know, sort of physical ma manipulation of the body as well. But also that they are, um, they can be very detrimental to your health if they're not released. You know, I was lucky, I suppose, that really the worst one for me was not being able to attend all the classes at my yoga teacher training because some of them were designed to be like the participant classes and others were designed where you would you would you know uh direct somebody so those ones where i could direct were fine but to get involved and demonstrate and that sort of thing didn't have a chance wasn't just wasn't going to happen was resting out absolutely um and so i think that's a really good you know way of way of being able to look at things as well as being able to think you know okay like so start working on my physical body and see what comes out even if you don't do anything else start working on your physical body to see what comes out start working on trusting your intuition and really feeling into your next um your next display, if you like, of emotion, so that you are able or you feel confident enough to speak through it, to try to retain some sort of level of eloquence. So even if you're angry, you don't respond with anger, you respond with love, you know, or you respond with kindness or, you know, something like that. Um, and just, you know, just really begin to kind of think about perhaps if you've got any aches and pains, what they might be related to. This uh, printout that I've done here you can kind of I just got it off of Google I don't know if you can even see it there it's there there's, there's the, the title what happens when you let chronic stress negative emotions affect your body you know interesting stuff so think about over the next week if you can think about how you are going to going to ascertain in your body whether you've got anything that still needs to be removed or whether or not you are in fact hiding from that realization or also hiding from the fact that you still lost that person and we'll begin to kind of go over those sorts of things in the next class um, or the next session sorry the next class the next session because I think it's really important. I think it's really important, like I said at the beginning, that we do open this dialogue and that we are aware of how deep our emotions really, really run because they're full on. You know, as much as you can cry and laugh and all that sort of thing, you know, so you can push yourself to understand and to accept and to learn from your intuition, um, you know, what what it is that you actually need to let go of and what may be still ailing you and if you've got actual pains in your joints or in your flesh then start looking at what that might be associated to and start giving yourself a little bit of time close your eyes you know practice your meditation and poses and sit there and really allow your mind to go through all the people that you may have some idea of you know oh, they didn't really help me that you know that's upset me there i wish that they'd been able to do that for me all those sorts of things and get yourself thinking about them so that when as we continue on you can begin to continue your work on being able to release the tension and the pressure and the stress that's built up through and into your body through um yeah through through the chakra points and just allowing that that physical body to hold that grief um instead of processing it all and getting it all out um I think it's it's you know it's a very very interesting one be aware again my advice is to journal through it if you're going to kind of do this if you're thinking to yourself actually I've got quite a lot of pain I'd love to know if anything comes up from it you'll you know you'll be going to a masseuse anyway so journal how you feel before you go in and journal how you feel when you come out so there's a very definite pattern you're able to see when you when you get going on it um but yeah I just I feel like this is actually going to be a massive, massive subject to cover. I've got so many notes still, um, but I'm going to finish for today. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me.
I hope you can see where I'm kind of going with this. I think our overall health on this planet really depends on us engaging with our emotions. Um, and I've discussed masculine and feminine energy before, and, and I have many theories as to why emotions aren't championed, if you like, why we don't spend time on emotions. Um, but I think a lot of the time it's, it's seen as being a weakness. You know, it's the masculine, again, that patriarchal society, always trying to stand tall, always trying to be clear, always trying to be direct and, and almost forceful, driven in its nature. And to have the vulnerability that comes with oh, uh, anxiety, for example, um, or empathetic pain or fear, you know, to have that vulnerability or sympathy to come and really kind of, you know, think about these things and, and, and be able to kind of process them. It's, it's an amazing thing that you can do for yourself. And I think that opening this dialogue now and really be kind of working through how it is that we can release these emotions, not just from this life potentially, but from past lives as well, that we're bringing in through within the, the, the pain body, within the body of flesh that we are now, but through DNA, you know, memory, um, it would be fascinating. So I think, yeah, we're going to continue this on for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I really want to explore this. Loads of notes that I've made about, um, I was reading into Eckhart Tolle as well. He was talking about a pain body, which from what I could kind of make out was like a, you know, another layer to yourself that when something happens and it affects you, it kind of lodges in there. Um, and just as that emotion uh, has affected you and lodging in there, so things can come through and kind of prod and release and prod and release as well, which we've just experienced, um, you know, with with my back, you know, being able to prod it and just just that hard prod into that spot just released so much for me. Um, and I've also kind of done all these notes about um, Eckhart Tolle and the pain body, my thoughts, you know, what I've sort of free thought with all of this sort of stuff um i think it's yeah i think it's a really important subject to deal with and i think it's great to be opening the subject now um so that the kind of the younger people of today as well can really begin to start afresh and start learning about their emotions from a really young age and learn about how to cope with them and learn about how they're gonna be able to utilize some um, and how some will make you feel kind of a different way and that you need to be able to process that, let go of that um, and, or work through it to be able to kind of really thrive in that in that time of your life. So thank you again so much for listening to me. Thank you for tuning in. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Namaste. Humanity has been on an epic journey of discovery learning the truth about the world we live in. New discoveries about the true origins of humanity, ancient history, free energy, as well as the systematic corruption of world governments are now on the forefront of our daily reality. Is the world headed towards destruction based on control and power? Or is an opportunity now being presented to shift and uplift into a higher consciousness? My name is Mel V co-founder and creative director of Conscious Consumer Network, an independent broadcast network that was launched on the 1st of January 2015. In the last three years, Conscious Consumer Network has broadcast over 2,800 shows in multiple languages, featuring guests from across the world, whilst creating media that is aimed at the creation of a free, fair, peaceful, just, sustainable world. Conscious Consumer Network provides full training and an interactive support network for all broadcasters and we are always looking for inspiring and educational content. Hi, this is Lainey Liberty. And this is Miro Siegel. In 2018, Conscious Consumer Network has expanded to multiple broadcast locations, increasing our availability and reach across the world, remaining on the cutting edge of independent media. If we wish to create a better world, we must first create better media, geared towards real education instead of indoctrination. 
you guys really are what changing the world is going to be about. It's educating kids at a grassroots level. Having become a pillar of stability in the turbulent world of independent media, we have even more going on in 2018. Conscious Consumer Network is a publicly funded network and we rely on all of you to keep us on the air. Show your support for independent media by donating to our 2018 Network Support Fund. Dare to seek a better world. Support independent media.